I should never have had cereal this morning. Or at least I could have chopped a banana. Had a slice of toast too, a yogurt, eggs, something with a little bit of weight to it. I'll need the energy. I feel empty, sluggish. I'll look awful on camera, unprepared, unprofessional. After all, I'm the, I'm the only student speaker. <laughs> They'll presume I was out partying, sidestepping my commitments, an ignorant and thoughtless waste of their time. It'll be my fault. I should have packed lunch, eaten backstage, but right before. Everything I've worked so tirelessly on would have been for nothing. I should drink more water. I've read somewhere that as people get older, they tend to lose their thirst sensation and confuse thirst with hunger. I'm just thirsty. What if I wet myself? I'll never get a job. I'll be Googled by potential employers. Their, their hiring decision will be based on the video of the guy that wet himself. <sighs> what if I change my name? Grow some facial hair? Not that I can. I should stop trying to convince myself and others into thinking that my poor attempts at a mustache constitute a guy that knows what he's talking about. Do I have any original thoughts? Or is my over-diligent studying an excuse for avoiding the hectic social and sexual fun of undergraduates these days? But then, who needs friends anyway? I could spend that time reading more, developing, proving myself. I've taken 13 bucks on behavioral economics, choice architecture, our irrational purchasing habits. All 13 are way overdue, and I haven't read a single page. <laughs> what, if I, what if I could find synopses, summaries online, print them, highlight, underline, and annotate? But then my printer doesn't work. I have a deadline in 12 days. How pathetic am I? <laughs> that right there is a compelling insight into the life and mind of a 21-year-old William Mills. In September 2013, I'd signed up for three years at the University of Birmingham. And finally, I had the license to do whatever I wanted to. A chance to challenge and to be challenged. An exhilarating sense of independence. Like-minded students, intellectual curiosity, and opportunities that go way beyond education. It took just 79 long and elusive days until my mother finally realized that it was time for me to come home. I developed a severe anxiety, welcome depression, and a taste for suicide. Immediately hospitalized, heavily medicated, and totally helpless, I was afraid. Back home in Southwest Wales, I was living with my mum. There was a level of safety and security in that. We were a low-income family, five children, outgoing, level-headed, and confident. Giselle Mills had pretty much single-handedly raised a doctor, a principal, a social worker, a filmmaker, and then me. Our relationship had always been extremely reserved until then, but we spoke a lot that year about everything, pain that she'd buried for a long time, so to be considered a good, strong, empowered individual. After all, she's an adult. Isn't it shameful to need help? The truth is, honest, intimate, and open communication is extremely valuable and underrated. Sharing our human side is liberating. After taking some time out, I reapplied to London's College of Communication in May 2014. It's been three years, and while this is enough to make anyone anxious, I'm feeling better. My problems have been solved, but only mine, and that bothers me. There is a structural problem that exists in universities worldwide, a diverse and fragmented institution that must be re-evaluated. There is a major cultural change in being a student, a whole new realm of expectations. And the truth is, we were never designed for the sedentary, indoor, socially isolated, sleep-deprived, Morley's fried chicken-laden, frenzied pace of student life. But we accept it. We are in the midst of an epidemic. 75% of students today will admit that they're experiencing some kind of emotional distress. Student suicides have more than doubled since 2011, and we have been totally negligent in our response. Of the 18,000 students here at UAL, an estimated one in 50 will have contemplated or attempted suicide. If you're able to, please stand. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Look around. 
If we take those of you that are here today and we multiply that by four, then that should be more or less equal to the number of individual attempts. And then if we continue to focus on those 360 or so students, but focus only on the front row, then these guys represent the mere 5% who are currently receiving treatment. And even then, those 12 to 15 will be added to a 33-week waiting list. By a show of hands, who here has children that are planning on or are currently attending university? Well, I expected an older crowd. <laughs> 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 okay, there is now a greater chance of losing your child from deliberate self-harm in undergraduate study than there is as a first-time driver. Yet, we continue to send them here. Everybody fears growing up. Mental ill health has become the disease of university life. It's a complex adversity that everyone suffers. We must begin to think for ourselves figure out our unique beliefs and act in a preconceived adult way. I would like to introduce Dr. Abraham Maslow, the father of humanistic psychology and creator of the hierarchy of needs. He believes in five consecutive stages of human behavior, or as I like to imagine them, stepping stones. And as we find our footing at each individual platform, only then are we ready to hop to the next. So at the very end of the pond, spectrum, we are presented with our physiological needs. And this is where we'll all start, because here we learn to breathe, eat, drink, sleep, and most importantly, survive. And when we've done all of those things, only then are we ready to move on up. And we do, to our safety needs, our second stepping stone, the need for both physical and emotional stability. And when we feel safe and secure enough to move on, we will, to our esteem needs, the need for confidence and a true sense of belonging. We can look in the mirror and feel prestigious because we like what we see and that makes us happy. Then and only then can we do what we came here to do. Self-actualize, stand out and excel, reach our greatest potential as both human beings and as students. Because after all, isn't that what university wants from us? To see our extraordinary abilities. The problem is human. These stepping stones are inexistent. We don't feel safe. We are isolated and have very little confidence in our abilities. These are difficulties that we are not prepared to tackle. We are so anxious about our own development that this occupies the capacity to focus on academics, the capacity to self-actualize. We will experience an academic paralysis. Our thinking is impaired, our projects are incomplete, and our courses are dropped. We are withdrawn and in a state of total despair. There is, however, no denying that university is extremely valuable. But the way things are is not the way that things have to be. There must be a broader, more holistic image of the future. We need to be design sensitive. We need to understand the culture and context of who it is we're designing for, students. Because the suffering is not unique to anyone. A few days ago, I posted this to my timeline. University makes me feel like. And it kind of encouraged others to come up with their own response. And these were just a few of them. A slave. Dying. A house burning down. An alcoholic. A wet flannel slowly peeling off the side of a bath that is a metaphor for sanity. <laughs> University is meant to be stressful. University is meant to make us feel this way. That's not true. We are all creative thinkers. We have the important strategic ability to solve whatever we want. And there is a world out there that is absolutely waiting. Together, we can create something brand new and inclusive of the undergraduate. So I had a go. It was October the 20th, 2016. Awake at one, breakfast by two, and university at three. And I sat there on the seventh floor of the tower block at LCC, confused. Believing in my ability to create change in the world around me less and less. There needed to be a planned course of action. I had no idea where to start. How can anyone break down a huge problem like this and begin to solve it piece by piece? But there is an answer. Empathy. The ability to understand and share the emotions of another human being. But that also brings us to stigma, which is a huge problem. 
because stigma is a powerful force in preventing students with mental health difficulties from gaining access to the appropriate support. And this is especially true in less helpful adolescent cultures. We have become experts at hiding this state, and we often have very good reasons for doing so. Very few people will talk to you about how they feel. It's sad, but it's true. So to really understand the student, we can't interview, because we'll get nothing back. And instead, we need to immerse ourselves into the community we're designing for. I'd like to introduce Nightline. Nightline is a non-judgmental listening service for undergraduates. We're talking about a team of students that regularly dedicate their time to helping others. They will commit to overnight duties. They will answer calls in the middle of the night period when everything seems bleak. I am now lucky enough to be an ambassador for this fantastic charity. And if there is anywhere we can observe the nature of students in their natural context, it is here. In design thinking, there are mainstream users and then there are extreme users. Like most students, mainstream users will experience low-level panic fear, and general uneasiness. On the other hand, extreme users will experience most physical manifestations. Their debilitating anxiety will morph into distress. Their fear is constant, worsening, and will affect everyday living. They can't make it to class, and they have lost access to all tools of self-governance. A few weeks into the inspiration phase, I met Grace. We only ever communicated, we only ever communicated via email. And like most extreme users I had met, she was having a really tough time. None of her closest friends knew, her tutors had no idea, and the university was blind. I asked Grace to photograph her life, send them over throughout the day, and she could caption the photos if she wanted to. I had to break down and understand the photos of Grace's day-to-day -day life, a photo ethnography as such, a visual representation of her feelings. And these were just a few of them just taken on her iPhone. These may not look like much, but from these we can gather some incredible insights. And hopefully some of you will relate to these. You see, our user sees enormous value in success. Their self-worth is determined by the extent to which they achieve. You get an E-grade, you're worth an E-grade. They have to be winners. We have to prove to others that we are doing well, and we fear letting others down. Our family, our tutors, and most importantly, ourselves. I'm just fine, look at me, I'm handling it. I'm juggling extracurricular activities, work, and life with friends. When in reality, we feel alone, isolated, and that no one feels like we do. Look at him, he's doing so well. Look at her, how does she do that? Seeing our other friends in university Enjoying their experience on Facebook or Twitter can be demoralizing. We are isolated and we see immense difficulty in belonging. And we worry about this and we worry about this constantly. So by working through the iterative rounds, we created a working solution. And this is only a point in the right direction. I'd like to remind you of that. I'd like to present Unity, a mobile application that deals with student sufferers. I wanted to invite Grace back to the studio, collaborate, work on the prototyping phase, because she had an amazing mind. But after a week or so, I still hadn't heard from her. And I was beginning to get a little bit worried. And it turns out that eight days earlier, Grace had attempted suicide. She had been in hospital ever since. Grace has now left university, and it was at that moment that it all felt very real. You see, I will now explain just a few of Unity's features. I better stick to this because developers can get very angry. Okay, so the opening chat page is an alternative to lengthy emailing. It's easy, intimate, and reassuring. Our personal profile page allows us to upload articles and readings that we have found useful, creating a community around learning. The meeting page is integrated into the university platform. We can organize out of our meetups with our friends. But most importantly, what this app does have is a monitoring, a monitoring page. So our tutors and the faculty can see who is reading, can see who is attending, can see his, who is communicating, and, who, and can see who needs help. I really do believe that this is a great time to put our creative abilities to the test. 
and create change in the world around us. It's an open call. Thank you.